Hello and welcome to the ECE 102 lesson on time management. If I were a student and heard a teacher mention time management, I would roll my eyes and tune out. Yeah, yeah, I think. Just turn in your work on time and have your time management covered. But there is much more to it than that. In fact, after many years of teaching, I've identified the two main skills that seem to best predict the level of a student's success in college. The first is communication. Can they follow my instructions? Can they tell me verbally or in writing where they need help? The second is time management. Can they organize all their many life tasks to get them done well and to avoid personal burnout? For most students, time management is relatively easier in their classes prior to college. In high school, middle school, elementary school, we are typically given daily readings or homework assignments, so we don't really need to plan ahead. Just do what is put in front of us each day. But in college, the model moves more towards a set of bigger projects that have freedom on when and where you work on them. This freedom is great for the flexibility it provides, but it ends up being a pitfall for many, many students. They don't have structures to use to manage their time, so the work doesn't get done. Here is a table of typical hours spent on various tasks in a week. It gives fairly generous allocations to sleeping, eating, hobbies, etc. In total, all the hours add up to 109. But how many hours are in a week? Well, 24 hours per day times 7 days per week gives us 168 hours. Wait, that's a big difference. What happens to those missing 59 hours? As an exercise, you will be asked to try to account for all the hours you spend in a week. Warning, this is hard to do. I challenge you to get up to 168. Because busyness is a fact of modern life, and especially college students, we want to be able to account for all of our hours in a week so we can use that time efficiently. One simple and useful tool is a weekly calendar. Here is one example of a weekly calendar, actually my own from a few years ago. As an exercise, you will be building your own. Notice how it includes fixed events like when classes are, but it needs to go beyond that. Include things like hobbies. You can see robotics club up here. Food, you can see lunch and breakfast. And when you will study for classes. You, you can't see it in my example, but you'll need to add those times in your calendar. Keep in mind two big goals. One, get done what you need to get done. And two, survive the semester. You are not a machine, but a human. Include the breaks, hobbies, and social events that keep you human. How much time should you set aside for schoolwork? The standard model is for each week and each credit to spend one hour in class and two hours outside of class. So, for a typical three-credit course, that means three hours a week in the classroom and six hours a week outside the classroom. If you take a full load in a semester, that is 15 credits, which equates to 45 hours per week. So yes, being a full-time student should require more work than a full-time job. Unfortunately, we have some limitations as humans. Cal Newport author of several books about being productive and avoiding burnout, has identified a cap of four hours per day of intense deep work. Think what coders or chess players do, or how you feel after a calculus exam. Thankfully, not all of our schoolwork is highly intense, although much of it is. So you need to space out your work. Winston Churchill, the famous prime minister of the UK during World War II, had a useful strategy on this front. At a stage in his life when he was writing a memoir, he also laid bricks around a garden for his daughters. His goal was 200 bricks and 2,000 words a day. He would alternate hours of intense mental work, writing the book, with physical work, laying bricks. This approach kept him fresh, both physically and mentally. You should pace yourself similarly. Don't try to be a machine. Include those necessary breaks in your weekly schedule. 
Another useful strategy to help you here is called the Pomodoro Technique. In fact, I'm using it right now as I produce this lesson video. The idea is simple. Work for 25 minutes, take a break for 5 minutes. Work for 25 minutes, take a break for 5 minutes. Repeat this for 4 cycles, or 2 hours. During those 25 minutes of focused work, don't let anything distract you. Keep the door closed and the phone silent. During those 5 minutes of break, try not to think about work at all. Listen to music, dance around, eat a snack. A few perks come from this method. First, it can be hard to get motivated to begin a big task, but you can nudge yourself into this action when it's just 25 minutes. Second, once you are in the flow of focused work, it can be hard to stop, but a break of just five minutes feels acceptable. Lastly, and most important, this is a simple way to avoid burnout of long study sessions. Making it through the whole semester is a marathon, not a sprint. Pace yourself. One valuable tool that I will emphasize heavily in this course is the use of a task database. This image shows part of an example task database made using the software Notion. At its core, it is just a list of things to get done, as you can see in the left column. But it's so much more than that. First, it's digitized, which makes it accessible from anywhere. Second, it includes additional columns for each task, like due date, how many hours it should take, and what larger projects it's associated with. You've probably heard the phrase, don't sweat the small stuff. The problem is, as humans, we can't help it. This quote by a neuroscientist explains why. When we have something on our minds that is important, especially a to-do item, we're afraid we'll forget it, so our brain rehearses it, tossing it around and around in circles, in something that cognitive psychologists actually refer to as the rehearsal loop, a network of brain regions that ties together the frontal cortex just behind your eyeballs and the hippocampus in the center of your brain. The problem is that it works too well keeping items in rehearsal until we attend to them. You surely have experienced this rehearsal loop in your own life. Have you ever had trouble falling asleep the night before a big trip? You probably were thinking about tiny details like things to pack or where you buy gas for your car. Have you ever turned off a song halfway through and then had it stuck in your head the rest of the day? Your brain keeps trying to rehearse how it's supposed to end. You want some kind of closure. In this class, we'll define these to-do items as nagging tasks. If you want to look up the idea later, many other folks call them open loops. These nagging tasks are any unfinished commitment, big or small, soon or in the distant future, part of your personal or professional life. It is wild how the fear of forgetting to check a baseball score could occupy as much brain space as remembering an equation for a physics test. A very interesting study is linked here. In it, the researchers separated participants randomly into two groups. In the first group, they had the people think about a big project they needed to get done. In the second group, they also had the people think about a big project but then had them write a list of steps to accomplish the project. Then they had each group take a reading quiz. Who do you think scored better? Based on this lesson, you could probably guess that group two scored much better. But why did they score better? They still had a big project to do, and they made no tangible progress towards getting it done. All they did was write down what they needed to do. This simple act cleared their minds and allowed them to focus on the next tasks. So, my advice to you is, write stuff down. Simple as that. But I'll give you even more structure. For this class, I'll have you construct your own task database, then use the simple workflow on this slide. One, anytime a nagging task pops up throughout your day, write it down in the database. Great. Now it's just a task and not nagging at you anymore. Two, 
once a day ref reference your task database and add details, the most important of which is the final due date of that task. 3. When you complete a task, delete it from your database. I have enough experience with this assignment I'm giving you to know that some students will take it seriously and some will brush it off as just something else a teacher wants them to do. I cannot be clearer than this. The students who use task management structures like this succeed. Students who don't, don't succeed. A few final notes to wrap up this presentation. First, plan your day to start with deep work. The mornings tend to be when we are less distracted and more ready to handle big projects. So put on your calendars time for studying in the morning. Second, breaks, exercise, and good food are vital to you, so put them on your weekly calendar. Third, you are going to learn more important things outside the classroom than in it. So set aside time for volunteer work or for hobbies. Fourth, be responsible to the people around you. It is hard to be teammates, or even worse, friends, with someone for long if they are consistently missing times to get together. Don't be that flaky friend. Fifth, check your email. This is a primary method of communication in today's college age. Important messages are sent to it. I recommend checking your school email once in the morning and once in the afternoon each day. Finally, you don't find time, you make time. Can I make the font any larger or bolder on that one? Life is busy nowadays. Almost no one wakes up and thinks, wow, I have so little to do today. Maybe I'll call up an old friend. If you wait for days like that, you'll be waiting a long time. So if something is important, then put it on your calendar. Don't let other distractions prevent you from doing what you think is important.